Today, we are wrapping up our Christmas series before Christmas Eve on the 23rd, not the 24th, Christmas Eve Eve. Um, but we're in a series right now called Reclaiming Wonderful, getting back to the most wonderful time of the year. And really what we've been doing, if you haven't uh, been with us over the past couple of weeks, what we've been doing is looking at some of these like abstract Christian or Christmas buzzwords and trying to make them a little bit more concrete while seeing how they connect to life and church and faith and Jesus. And so we were looking at things like these are the things that really, really have the ability to make Christmas and all of life wonderful. But sometimes they're like kind of lost in abstraction. And so if you want to check out the whole series, you can go on our app or go on YouTube, go online. Uh, But just to kind of bring you up to speed real quick, what we said in the beginning is uh, the first week we talked about joy, joy, right? Which is obviously a little bit abstract for the most part. We understand what joy is, but we said if you're not feeling joy, if your circumstances don't bring you joy, it could be as simple as choosing to see the good, gratitude, and looking for opportunities to give, generosity. And that has a way of bringing us back to a place of joy, not just in Christmas, but all year. And then the next week we talked about hope, hope, not optimism, You know, not our our circumstances looking hopeful, but hope like an anchor you can hold on to in spite of your circumstances. We talked about Mary's story and how messy and complicated that was. And then last week, Tom talked about peace, that feeling of everything just being just right, right? Kids go to bed, everything's quiet. And how we can have that, even when the kids aren't in bed, or when life is not super easy and clean and just right. And so today we're talking about another one of those abstract concepts, and we'll get to it in a second. But first, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my, my son, all right? If you haven't met him, his name is Logan. He's six years old. He's just a ball of energy and joy. And he usually doesn't have shoes on, so... If you see him running around the church without shoes on, tell him to put on his shoes. I've told him about 300 times. Uh, He right now is in this stage where he's just asking questions all the time. All questions, all the time. There's no room in life, no room in his mind for uncertainty about anything. He's got to know, right? And so when he goes in the car, it's like the car activates his question asker. He's just got a thousand questions in the car. And recently, he's, he's went, gone into like the world of math, math questions. And I'm not the guy you ask math questions to. He's in the back seat and I'm driving. He'll be like, uh, all right, what's 40 plus 70? Actually, no, 60, 35, and um, 10 hundred. And I'm like, Logan, Logan, we're going to crash, you know, like... You can't, you can't like go and be like, okay. But he asks questions. And one of his favorite categories is like the why category. Well, why? He'll see something and just ask, why? Like we drove past a cemetery a little while ago, literally a few days ago. And he goes, why do they put a rock on top of you when you die? I was like, that's a gravestone. Uh, And he goes, "Uh, does it hurt? And I was like, well... You know, your, your body's in the ground, but you're not really there. You know, you're in heaven and it doesn't hurt. You know, there's no pain. You're not going to cry in heaven. And I'm realizing this is getting very deep very quickly, you know. And he goes, you don't cry in heaven? I was like, well, no. No, you're, you won't be sad. There won't be pain in heaven. He goes, all right. He gets quiet for a couple seconds. Then he goes, so... If I fall down the stairs, smack into a wall, break through the window, and then someone shoots me with a nail gun, I'm not going to (laughs) cry? Like, all right, no. That's what we get for letting him watch Home Alone. (laughs) Then he goes, uh, goes, I want to go to heaven. Like, okay, well, keep asking me math problems while I'm driving and we'll be there soon. Why? Why? I was asking why. And while this is like sometimes a little exhausting, sometimes a little annoying, it's also very insightful. 
because it forced me to try and explain things I don't typically have to explain, right? Often in very simple terms. And so here's a why question for you. Why? Why Christmas? Why do we celebrate Christmas? Or, or what's the true meaning? The true meaning of Christmas. Or to put it in a totally unique way that you've never heard before, what's the reason for the season? What's the reason for the season? Think about that. Now, um, Probably you have some answer that comes to mind right away, and you know, I get that. But if you just put that on hold for a second, have you ever thought about how often, how, how many different groups of people, how many different movies, how many different books, stories, songs have proposed a meaning, an answer to the true meaning of Christmas, right? If you're into Christmas movies, you know, you know, often the movie ends with, well, this is the true meaning of Christmas. Like if you've seen Miracle on 34th Street, right? Well, the true meaning of Christmas at the end of that is belief, just belief in general, just faith, trusting in what you can't See, if you've seen A Wonderful Life or A Christmas Carol, the true meaning of Christmas is, you know, the lives that we touch, that we often don't realize we're having an impact on, right? Or if you've uh, seen Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the true meaning of Christmas comes back to this idea of acceptance. If you're into the, a lot of the Hallmark Christmas movies, it often comes back to this idea that it's better to give than to receive. Uh, other movies have suggested that it goes back to the memories that we create as a family, right? Or with the people you love. There are so many different movies, so many different stories taking a stab at this idea of, well, this is the true meaning of Christmas. This is the reason for the season. But is there a way we can know what the reason for the season is? What the true meaning of Christmas actually is? And what are we asking when we say the true meaning of Christmas? What's the true meaning? What's the reason for the season? Like, what are we actually looking for? What if we said, like, what, what is the idea that should dominate my understanding of why we're doing what we're doing in this season, right? What should the dominating idea of Christmas be? If I forget to remember everything I'm supposed to remember about Christmas, well, what is it supposed to feel like? What am I supposed to feel when I feel about Christmas? What am I supposed to feel? think when I think about Christmas, if there's one thing, if I'm not into any of the trees, the lights, if I hate it, if I hate this season, but I still want to know what it's all about, what's the one thing? If my six-year-old in the backseat says, why Christmas? What's the one thing, the reason for the season? You ready? I'm going to tell you. The answer is Jesus. Yeah. Surprise. Now, you've probably heard this before, and you've probably seen this on a bumper sticker. You're probably thinking, especially if you're not into church, like, really, are we serious? Right? And here's what I would suggest. To say Jesus is the reason for the season, it's not incorrect. But it might be incomplete. Not incorrect, but it might be incomplete. Because if, if you're not careful, maybe you've experienced this on both sides. If you're not careful, when we say Jesus is the reason for the season, what, what we're suggesting is, well, we celebrate Christmas for Jesus, right? It's Jesus' birthday. And subtly and slowly, this need to protect the reason for the season to protect the fact that we're celebrating for Jesus can kind of creep in. And in the same way you would protect the birthday of someone you love, we feel the need to protect. The church often feels the need to protect Jesus, right? Like if it's my mom's birthday and I say, you know, I'm going to go have a party with my friends. My dad would step in and be like, no, 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 you're not. It's your mom's birthday. We're going to celebrate your mom. And often this is kind of the tone of the church. 
And, and subtly, slowly, not all the time, but often, what kind of creeps in underneath is this justified feeling of resentment for the world. And so you're in line in the stores and on the street. And you're dealing with the Christmas craziness and you're in Marshalls and the line's 59 miles long and you see people talking on their phones too loud and they're yelling at the cashiers and it's just chaos and you're not happy to be there and it's hot, but you don't want to hold your jacket and it's just uncomfortable. It's easy to look and start to resent the consumerism of Christmas, right? And feel like, well, Jesus is the reason for the season. You know, or you're in traffic and you're backed up and you're just trying to get home and now you got people trying to merge and they're doing like the, you know, just creeping in and it's the guy who gets in is the one who cares less about their car, you know, and it's frustrating and it, it, can, it can build up a sense of resentment. Like, this is not Jesus. You know, Jesus is the reason for the season and, and we're, we're missing it. Or maybe you have a big family gathering on Christmas Eve or on Christmas Day, and a fight breaks out, and there's frustration, and people are angry at each other. And it can, you can step back and feel like we're missing the whole point. Or maybe there are people in your life that don't believe what you believe. Maybe they make fun of you because of what you believe. Maybe they resent what you believe. And you can watch them having fun and going to Christmas parties, and if that resentment has sunken in deep enough, there can be this feeling like, well, you're not even celebrating the right thing. You shouldn't even be celebrating. You don't even believe any of this. And all of a sudden, the church as a whole takes like a, a, a militant posture toward the world because Jesus is the reason for the season. And maybe for you, maybe even on the other end of this, maybe Christmas for you has been hard. Maybe you, you are reminded of loss during Christmas. Maybe it's a season you feel like you need to go through. And for you, it just stinks. And maybe you've told that to, to a well-intentioned church person. And maybe you've been told, well, it's not about you anyway. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is the reason for the season. I would suggest that if we arrive at any of those places, we've arrived at the wrong place. Because while saying Jesus is the reason for the season is not incorrect, it's incomplete. It's incomplete. And so... What do we do? Well, what if to get the complete version of the reason for the season, you step right into the shoes of a curious six-year-old and say, well, rather than asking why Christmas or, or after asking why Christmas, if the answer is Jesus, well, then what if we ask why Jesus? Why did Jesus come? There's your answer to the reason for the season. Why was Jesus given to us? Why? That we have a very clear answer to. And you might have heard these words before. John, who is a close friend of Jesus, kind of summarizes the whole thing, the whole story about Jesus, why he showed up, and what he was doing. He says it like this. He says, why Jesus? For God? So loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Now, you might, you might know the rest of that verse if you grew up in church, but let's stop right there. If you want to know why God gave his one and only son, why Jesus showed up for it, the answer is right there. It's for God so loved the world. Why Jesus? God's love for the world the thing that motivated him was simply love, love. To, to be more specific, it's God's love for the world. That's the reason for the season. And it's not like the world, like, oh, I love that place. It's the best. I made it. You know, it's like, no, God's love, not the world, but for us. And if you take it a little bit deeper, and what we see in the life of Jesus is an individual, personal, I know your name kind of love to every single person he interacted with. 
In other words, we can say it's not just God's love for us. It's God's love for you. That's the reason for the season, for you and for me. You know, we see a pattern for God so loved the world that he gave. And if you know the rest, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have. And you see this pattern, God gave so we can have. Jesus came so we can have. Jesus said later up when he, he, later on when he grew up, he said, I have come that they may have. He wasn't just up there like bored looking for something to do. He came for a reason and people are that reason. You are that reason reason. I think if you were to sit down with Jesus today in the middle of the most Christmassy Christmas scene you can possibly think of, maybe it's on an ice skating rink at Rockefeller Center or, or surrounded by Christmas lights, and you looked around and said, what's the reason for all of this? If Jesus were sitting right there and it were just you and him, I think he'd look at you and he'd say, you are. You are the reason why I came. And so, yes, it's all about Jesus, but Jesus was all about you. And that changes things, right? If that's how we understand the reason of the season, well, then you're in line on the street and in the stores. And you're dealing with the frustration of Christmas. And, and there is something about knowing that there is a God who is in your corner, who cares about you, who gave everything for you. That just, that just can sustain you through those difficulties. And you, you can deal with the difficulties at home, at family dinners, at your Christmas Eve dinner when a fight breaks out and things are hard in your personal life and you wish it went this way, but it actually went this way. There's something about knowing, you know what, on the outside, everything might be going crazy, but there's, there is a God who cares about me and he knows my situation. Not because I have done it all right. In fact, the followers of Jesus who came after Jesus would explain, no, it's actually often when you're doing it all wrong. That's, that's how we, and when we need to understand the depths of God's love. Not when we're doing it all right, but when we're doing it all wrong, when we don't believe, when we're doubting, when we're struggling, when we're failing. And knowing that has the ability to change how we handle all the things going on around us. And, and, and so it changes the way we see the lines in the streets, on the stores. It changes the way we handle our family issues. And if, if you, if for you, Christmas stinks and it's a season you just push through and you can't wait for it to be over because you get no joy out of anything that's going on. Instead of being told it, it's all about Jesus, Period. Knowing that it's all about Jesus who made it all about you now offers you something from the Christmas season, a kind of hope, peace, joy, and love that's better than what we can get from the Christmas lights and the parties. So pause right there for a second. All right, that's important, but shift gears, and hopefully this will make sense, Hopefully. Um, in the Christmas story, right? You might have heard the Christmas story, nativity scene, you know, the barn we talked about a little bit last week. Imagine the, the nativity, right? The picture. If you don't know what it looks like, just drive down the road. Someone's got it on their front lawn, all right? You got Mary, Joseph, baby Jesus. Then there's some other people there. There's this one group of people that are at that scene. They're the shepherds. Now, we, if you've ever heard the story, if you know the shepherds, you know, they probably look really cute. They got like the lamb and it's asleep and he's petting it and it's beautiful and peaceful, right? And so we're like, oh, I wish there was a shepherd at my birth, you know? In, in reality, shepherds were totally pushed out of the religious community. They were considered outcasts. In, in that community, the community that Jesus grew up in, they often would have been seen as unclean because of the things that they were exposed to on a regular basis, meaning they couldn't participate in regular normal life. They lived out in their fields taking care of their sheep, not just because it was necessary, but because they, no one wanted them in their regular operations. They were simply a necessary part of society. 
And here's what happens with the shepherds. In the story, it says this. It says, and there were shepherds living, living, not just hanging, living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night, living out there, totally separate from society as a necessary part, but nobody wants them. And, and they're approached by an angel, miraculously. They get an invitation, and the angel says this to them. It says, today in the town of David, which is a reference to Bethlehem, a savior, a hero has been born to all the people that are getting it right, to all the people that go to church, to all the religious people, to the people that have been waiting for it. No, they say to what you need to know is to you. A savior has been born to you. And so they go and they see the baby. They see it lying in the manger. I told you the story two weeks ago. And they are there the night that Jesus is born. They're invited by God, okay? Pause, another random story. If you go back to that little nativity scene, right? You got the baby, Jesus, Mary, the shepherds. Then you got a bunch of other guys over here dressed real fancy. We call them like the wise men, kings, the magi. There's often three of them. They've got boxes, you know? You know the people I'm talking about? Dressed all nice? Yeah. So fun fact, we, we call them the wise men uh, or kings. They probably weren't kings. Um, there may not have been three of them. They came with three gifts, so we assume that they were three. And they weren't actually there the night that Jesus was born. They came days later, maybe even weeks or months later, okay? Um, but they're invited. They're invited. And what you need to know about these people is that they're known as the Magi. That word is the same word, is the place where we get our word for magic. They were sorcerers. They participated in witchcraft. They, they would read the skies, the stars, and try and decipher like what the pagan gods were telling them. They weren't part of the religious community. They weren't from Jerusalem, which is where the, you know, the religious people were. They were totally way out there. And they did things that were not cool in the community that Jesus grew up in. In fact, if you were caught Doing what magi did, they'd kill you. That's how serious this was. Not only were you unclean, but you weren't uh, like, allowed to live if you participated in what they were doing. And here's, here's the magi, okay? They, they show up, or here's how we meet them. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, this is according to Matthew, during the time of King Herod, meaning this is a historical event. This is something that they would remember. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. We don't even know where they're from. They're just from the east. You know, they, don't, they get a direction. They don't even get a place. They came to Jerusalem, which is the holy city. And they asked, where is the one who's been born the king of the Jews? Who told them? How'd they find out? They say... We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, that star, okay, in your little nativity scene, it's probably like at the top, hangs, or it's on top of the manger. We love it. We got songs about it, you know, star of wonder, star of night or bright, right? Like, it's, it's become part of the story. However, however, for them, what they're doing, they're, they're saying, we were reading the stars. We were practicing astrology, which is against the Jewish, ancient Jewish law, we were doing what is unlawful to you, and we believe in doing that, we've been told that the king of the Jews is born. It says Herod and everyone there, they were disturbed by the fact that they said this. It bothered them because they're breaking all the rules. People, even today, people who study this are like, we don't really know what to say about this. We don't know what to do because it doesn't fit in the box that we have. The fact that they were doing things that were not cool, not okay at that time. And they're, they're suggesting God told them something. And then, and then they go to Jesus and they bring him gifts. You know, this is their thing. They're the guys that they bring, they bring the gifts. It says, they open their treasures and they presented him with gifts of, what were they? They were gold. Come on, everybody. Frankincense and myrrh. And at first you look at these and just think, okay, one of these things is way more expensive than the other things, right? But the more significant thing is that gold, frankincense, and myrrh were things that they used in their pagan ritual sorcery practices. It wasn't just three random things they had laying around. 
And so my point is, my point is, these people were not needed and they were not wanted. This would have been a disturbing part of the story. If you were reading this for the first time as an ancient Jewish people, you would think somebody broke into the library, stole Matthew's story and inserted this because it is ludicrous. No one would have wanted them there. No one would have needed them there. And they're included in the story. Here's my point. Why were the shepherds and the magi invited directly by God? Because no one else would have invited them. It's as if in the Christmas story, we're being told, in case there is any confusion about who Jesus came for, about who God loves, about who we're including in this description of the world. In case you're tempted to put a footnote or a little asterisk or that little star thing that indicates there's something else at the bottom of the page. No, in case you're tempted to make an exception, he came for the world, meaning the people who were waiting for him, the people who wanted him, and the people nobody needed and the people nobody wanted. In other words, the, the, the reason why there's Christmas, the reason why there's Jesus is God's love for you, but it's also God's love for them. Them. When I say them, I mean your them, my them. We all have a them. You know, maybe it's, it's somebody in your life that you don't want to be there. Somebody in your life that you don't need. Somebody in your life who's an inconvenience, a difficulty, that person you can't forgive, the, the social media troll, the mean mom at the bus stop, the mean guy at work, the boss you can't stand, that member of the family that you can't forgive, the one that you won't invite to Christmas dinner, there's a them. There's a them. And I think if you and I were to sit down with Jesus in the heart of the Christmas season and say, what's the reason for all of this? He would say, they are. He came for the people that no one needs and no one wants. He came for the people that you don't need and you don't want. People that are difficult, people that drive you nuts, they are the reason for the season as much as you are. And, and you see how that, how that can change the way we see everything if that becomes the dominating idea of the way we understand Christmas? When you're in the lines, in the stores, and you're looking at the people yell at the cashiers and they're fighting with one another and that one's talking too loud on her phone and they're driving each other. And, and you just like, how does it change the way you feel if you step back and remind yourself that they are the reason for the season? The people in traffic that cut you off, that try to merge, that drive like they got their license from a gumball machine, those people, like, how does it change the way you feel about them? If you take a step back and you remember, they are the reason for the season. When a fight breaks out at your Christmas Eve dinner and he did it again, she said it again. She said she wasn't gonna go there, but she brought it up. This is why we didn't want her to come. This is why we asked him not to show up. They are the reason for the season. They're the reason why Jesus came. It's all about Jesus, but he is all about them just as much as he's all about you and me. So we're out of time. Uh, I'm going to ask the band to come up here and we'll wrap things up. But there's, there's an idea I, I want to leave you with. You know, maybe you don't believe any of this. Maybe you're here today because you're doing someone a favor and we're glad that you're here either way. Uh, and maybe today for you, all we did was reframe the idea that Jesus is the reason for the season, kind of complete that picture for you. And if so, great. But if you're someone who's been in church, if you're someone who's wrestling with some of these things on your own, 
My guess is that one side of what we talked about today probably hits you more than the other. Like maybe you really need to know that God's love for you is the reason for the season. Or maybe you need to know that God's love for them is the reason for the season. One probably hits you a little stronger than the other. But the cool thing about this, as John, the same guy who wrote John 3.16 would say, is that they're, they're woven together, the two of them. They're more related than we might think. He said, in one of his later letters, he said that we love other people, the people we don't like, the people we don't want, the people we don't need, people that get on our nerves. We love because he first loved us, because God first loved us in our broken, imperfect, messed up state. And from there, we find the strength to love other people. And so what I'm suggesting is that either way, no matter where you find yourself, the key for you and the key for me, and really, really what will get us back to these things that we consider wonderful is understanding how much God loves us, how much God loves you. It's why the Apostle Paul later on said when he prays, his prayer for the church is not for their safety, not that they would get the job that they want, not that they get the girlfriend or the boyfriend or the thing, but that they would understand just how wide, how long, how high, and how deep God's love is for them. And then he says, it surpasses knowledge. It surpasses knowledge. And that's, that's my prayer for us, that each one of us here would wrestle with that. And as we do that, I think, hopefully, we'll come to understand a more complete concept of the reason for the season.